Well, welcome everybody once again. I'm Peter Levitoff and I'm uh, the convener or the chair of the planning committee for the winter lecture series for this year. Um, this is the fourth of four. Uh, and I just would like to remind everyone that uh, thanks to uh, Humanities Nebraska and the Unitarian Church uh, Social Action Committee, uh, the program has been able to, uh, to stay with us for many years, um, which reminds me that uh, in a little while, uh, our uh, technical person, Bob Fusun, will put into the chat uh, a link. And we really would like to have your input as, uh, this is not a formal evaluation, but uh, we'd really like to have your input as to what you thought of the series, what you thought of the topic, what have you thought of the the quality of the uh, of the presentations, what you thought of the discussion, and very much also uh, your suggestions for topics for the committee to consider for next year and subsequent years. We look at these very carefully, and we'd like to bring you what you want to hear. So uh, I'll remind everyone again uh, at the end of the talk, after the Q and A and the discussion, uh, we. Uh, because not everybody is, people are still coming in right now as I'm, I'm speaking, and I want to be sure everybody uh, knows that and has that opportunity. Um, as usual, uh, your, uh, your, your video is off and you're, you're muted, but uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our speaker through the chat function, which will be moderated by Bob Fusen after the speaker is concluded. And we might even be able to have a, a discussion. You, uh, when we go through the chat questions, uh, you'll you'll be able to uh, to unmute. You can uh, click on the little icon to raise your hand, and we can call on you. You can make a comment. You can ask a question orally, or you can try to engage in some discussion. So, without further ado, uh, I'm pleased to introduce. Uh, professor John Comer, a uh, retired emeritus professor of political science, former chair of the department, and also an expert himself in American politics. And he will introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, so go, go ahead, uh, Jack. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure uh, to present my friend and former uh, colleague in the Department of Political Science, at UNL, Kevin Smith. Um, Kevin joined the department in 1994 after receiving his PhD uh, from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, and quickly distinguished himself as a productive scholar and outstanding teacher. Uh, he's the, he is the author uh, or co-author of 10 books uh, and more than 50 articles in scholarly journals in a number of different academic disciplines. His scholarly activity uh, earned him UNL's College of Arts and Sciences Outstanding Research and Creative Achievement Award uh, in um, um, 2010, and the Leland J. and Dorothy H. Olson Academic Chair in 2018. Uh, in addition to uh, serving as chair of the Department of Political Science, uh, he is the director of UNL's Systems Biology of Social Behavior Initiative uh, and co-director of UNL's Political Physiology Lab. His uh, teaching uh, and research interests include uh, public policy, public administration, American politics, and biology and politics. Um, uh, th those of us in the department that could not match uh, uh, Kevin uh, in the classroom uh, claimed he wowed the students with his mesmerizing English accent. Uh, well, we are pleased to have him uh, this evening, English accent and all, uh, to help us understand uh, what's been happening in the U.S. and the world of politics. Well, Kev, the stage is yours. Take it away. Well, thank you very much for that very warm and kind introduction, Jack. Uh, I, you might have set me up for a fall. I'm not sure I can I can live up to that. But thanks for the welcome. Thanks for the thanks for the invitation. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, when I 
agreed to do this. I didn't realize that I was doing it on the time change day, um, which is less of a spring forward for me and, and more of sort of like a stumble sideways into temporal confusion. So one of the things I think we should all agree on is anyone who shows up late is to be forgiven, even if they show up, show up tomorrow. Well, hopefully uh, this evening, uh, you know, even if I am stumbling around a little temporal confusion, I'm hoping to bring a little bit of clarity on the topic of polarization, which I know for many of you uh, listening in, uh, watching in in the audience today is, is something that you've been paying some attention to in the winter lecture series over the past, past few weeks. But specifically what I want to do before our time um, expires here is I want to uh, not maybe not answer. I, I think that might be a little overconfident, you know, that anyone has the answers to all of these questions, but at least get something of an answer to four main questions. I want some clarity on what polarization is, on what polarization is doing to us. And by us, I mean very specifically the American political system. Uh, I want some clarity um, or to, you know, transmit some clear explanation on why this happened and maybe at the end give a few, I, I hope, hopeful takeaways on what can be done about it. So just to begin with, polarization can be defined one way is, sim is simply as, as disagreement, is policy disagreement. Um, you know, people polarize into different camps on various issues. I mean, this could be taxes, it could be gun control, could be abortion, it could be whatever. They can polarize into broader camps on ideology. Conservatives think we should have a smaller government. Liberals believe that we should have a larger, more activist government. But the key part of this definition is it's a disagreement over some substantive policy or um, idea of what government should or should not be doing. There's also another way to think of polarization, and this is the one that has many political scientists kind of concerned and worried, and, and this is what we term affective polarization. And affective polarization is a polarization that is not necessarily based in a disagreement on policy or ideology. It's based in an emotional dislike of the political other. So this is a situation where you know, you may have you know, completely incorrect ideas about the other side's um, uh, policy stands or ideological views. And in a way, that doesn't matter. You just don't like them on, on a deep emotional level. It's like, I don't know, Nebraska and Oklahoma back in the 70s or something like that. It's, it's we just don't like each other. Now, disagreement is something that democratic systems are kind of set up to handle. I mean, this is their entire purpose. You know, if, we got, if we're going to have disagreements, we're going to count heads rather than break them. So if you imagine kind of like um, uh, opinion on a issue ranging from uh, liberal on the left to conservative and uh, on the right, and that uh, those opinions, those attitudes are distributed along something that is approximating a normal curve, a bell curve, like I've got up here on the, on the on the screen. You know, democracy has no problem with that. The sausage maker grinds through, and we get to some sort of agreement. There's some sort of compromise that typically lands in the middle. That's exactly what a representative form of democracy, such as that that we have in the United States, is set up to deal with. Things get a little tougher when disagreement starts to take on more uh, a more extreme nature. So if you've got one set of attitudes that are pulling out on the left away from the center, and you've got one set of attitudes that are pulling out from the center on the, on the right. In other words, the disagreement is getting further and further apart. It makes it harder to reach that compromise, especially when the middle largely disappears and the middle consists of sort of like this overlap that I've sort of like got schematically drawn up here is, is when this is minimal, um, it, it makes compromise really hard. Now, democratic systems can still function as long as this peak and this peak is not too far away. Now, the sausage machine might not look great, and it tends to grind up some people as it's going along. 
But the democratic system can still handle this kind of thing. And we've seen this at various um, uh, parts in our history in, in, in the United States when we've gotten you know, pretty upset with each other. The system can still function. Um, when it starts to have real problems is when this distribution of attitudes, rather than sort of like, you know, following this kind of normal distribution where there's something in the middle, and even if it splits into two normal distributions, where it gets really tough is when that is essentially inverted. And basically, there's no middle. The attitudes all pile up on one side and on the other. And there's just not much in the middle that we can agree with. And if you combine that with a dislike of the people on the other side, then we've got a real problem. Basically, what you have is a situation where people start to moralize their politics. They start to sacralize their politics. And moral morality politics to political scientists means sort of like a specific thing. It basically means that our political attitudes are based on first principles. In other words, what we believe to be right and wrong. And there's no compromise on what you believe to be right and wrong. And if you give us more information, it's not going to change our mind. We're not really thinking about this rationally. This is an emotional faith-based attachment to our political identities. That cuts out room to com compromise. And if the system is working, conflict tends to be figured out in a judicial arena rather than a legislative arena, because the legislators reflect our differences and just find it hard to um, find it hard to compromise. If this gets too extreme and the system can't handle it, that's when the system really starts to break down and, you know, it can spill over into extrajudicial and extra legal forms of political activity. And this can be civil unrest and up to and including um, uh, violence. So, um, you know, with that as sort of like context and definition, definitional background, I guess, I guess the big question to start moving on is, is, is where are we? I mean, if you think of the United States today, I mean, most people are pretty worried about it in, in terms of our attitudes towards politics and our tribalization and our sort of like scamper into two different um, uh, political camps. But, but where are we? Are we in a... Um, a uh, situation where the system can keep functioning, or are we headed to, you know, something of a nasty divorce where things are going to get, you know, pretty worse before they have any hope of getting any better? Well, one of the things that we know for sure is that elites are polarizing. So what I've got up on the screen right now, if you look at that graphic on the left, these are DW nominate scores, um, which you can eff effectively think of as average ideology scores for members of Congress over a, a 50 year span between 63 and 2013. And what you can see there is Republican members of Congress in the red, they're pulling away and moving to the right steadily over time. And if you look at the, 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 the blue distributions, these are Democrats, they're not moving too much to the left. But one of the things I want you to notice there is that distribution is getting um, less wide. It's getting less dispersed. Democrats are, you know, there's, there's less of a range of attitudes there. What I've got over on the right is the average difference between the parties on their uh, uh, ideology. So basically what this represents is what is the difference between, uh, in, in ideological terms, between the average Republican and the average Democrat in Congress. And what you can clearly see here is we've gotten sort of like this um, you know, huge rise that began kind of like in the late 60s and has really never stopped. Clearly, that at the elite level, at least when we're looking at uh, members of Congress, and this is also true of most, most state legislatures now too, is that the parties are polarizing. They are more and more different ideologically, and that is reflected in their uh, policy agendas. But it's not just elites that are polarizing. One of the things that we can see is that the mass public is all, uh, also polarizing. So what I've got here is a, uh, a, a couple of distributions representing the, uh, you know, the middle of the road Democrat and the middle of the road re Republican on 10 policy issues, uh, or rather 10 questions about attitudes towards government and public policy that have been asked consistently by Pew 
um, over a 20-year period or so. And what you can see there is those distributions are definitely starting to pull further and for further apart. And I mean, they haven't quite like split into completely different camps yet, but the, the direction is unmistakable. Um, the you know, run-of-the-mill Democrat and the run-of-the-mill uh, Republican are very different from each other on policy and attitudes towards government now compared to where they were 20 or 30 years ago. But it's not policy that really worries political scientists. It's sort of like more of this, this notion of affective polarization that I defined earlier. And a simple way to measure affective polarization is with what's known as a feeling thermometer. And a feeling thermometer is simply when you, you ask people on a scale of a zero to 100, how warm or cold you feel towards your political party and how warm or cold do you feel towards the other political party. And if you look at, you know, 40 years of, of polling on this is our feelings towards our own um, uh, uh, partisan tribe haven't changed much. I mean, there's just, that's this green line and there's just pretty much no movement there. Where it has changed is our feelings towards the other party. You know, back in 1980, uh, on, on a standard feeling thermometer, those averaged about 50. So it wasn't warm or, or it wasn't cold. It was right, right in the middle. Now it's around 20. And this yellow line represents the difference between those blue and green lines. And that represents the, the, the gap between feeling thermometer scores towards our own political party and feeling thermometer scores to the other uh, uh, political party. And that gap is now 50 percentage points, which is basically the highest that we've ever measured. And this is a phenomenon that particularly seems to strike the United States. If you take sort of like that feeling thermometer idea and apply it to other countries, I mean, is polarization happening in other countries? Yeah, in some countries it is. I mean, if you look at places like Germany, there's clearly a um, a, a positive trend towards more polarization uh, over the years. But, you know, some of the most recent research, I'm, I'm pulling this from a scholarly article that came out literally a couple of weeks ago, is worse in the political, is worse in the political, uh, sorry, it's worse in the United States than it is um, uh, anywhere else. Um, basically, it doesn't matter how you measure it, polarization is increasing, and it seems to be increasing in the United States more than in other Western liberal democracies. And again, I just want to emphasize this isn't just a policy ag agreement. Um, it is rooted in, you know, we really don't like, um, you know, our, the, the opposing political tribe. And what I've got up on the screen right now are the results from a, a survey from a study I did um, uh, a year or two ago. And this is just sort of like polling uh, Americans. And as you can see on the screen, nearly two thirds of them say they grow angry when um, other people say nice things about the other political party. So, you know, the vast majority of Americans are saying, I feel mad. It upsets me when people talk nice about the other political team. Um, you know, a third of Americans are now sort of like, it's, it's creeping into their language. Um, when they talk about Democrats and Republicans or liberals and conservatives, they explicitly use we and them. It's, it's us and them. We're literally dividing into us and them. And, you know, nearly 40% of Americans say that they just don't have much in common um, uh, with their political opposites, which is kind of a shocking finding when you, when, when you think about it, is you know, people who have different attitudes towards government, uh, government than me, they're just so different. I just don't have much in, in common with them. I mean, we're seeing splits now between Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives that rival things um, like generational splits or gender splits or race or splits along the lines of things like race and ethnicity. So the key takeaway from sort of like this, this, this first part of the talk is that we can argue about where we are on this uh, continuum of, you know, what we would think of as, quote unquote, normal disagreement in a democracy towards this, you know, visceral dislike of each other where we're about to descend into, um, uh, you know, uh, extra legal uh, disagreement. 
Where there's pretty much unanimity, at least among political scientists, though, is there's no doubt that polarization is a real thing. And there's no doubt that it's it's getting worse. So there's pretty much no disagreement on which way we're heading on this, this scale. So what is this doing to us? What is this, you know, by now 40 years, you know, steady trend towards tribal, um, uh, you know, America splitting into tribal camps? What is it doing to us? Well, I've, it's doing a lot of stuff to us. And I've just got four takeaways that I wanted to share that are reflected upon on, on this slide. And one is that politics is now, um, it's an identity division. Politics is increasingly part of our identity. When somebody says something, if you're a Republican and somebody says something derogatory about Republicans, you tend to take that personally, that you take that as a personal insult because it's a fundamental part of your identity. You know, like your, uh, sexual orientation um, or, or your gender or your sex or your race or ethnicity would be. Um, you, you take any sort of like um, uh, negative statement about your quote unquote political tribe as a, a, a personal affront, an insult. Elites, because they reflect those divisions, it makes compromise really hard uh, uh, to come by. If those elites compromise, they are seen by their own uh, tribe as traitors to the cause. They're seen as sellouts. So we're seeing more things like gridlock and not just the federal government, but also increasingly in state legislatures. It also, you know, it also creates kind of like a toxic political environment. And one of the knock on effects of uh, increases in polarization, we are increasingly convinced of in my discipline is that politics is now starting to affect the mental and, and sometimes even the physical health of uh, American adults. And I'm gonna share some data in just a little bit to, to back that claim up. But there's now a small but growing um, uh, research agenda uh, in, in, in political science and in psychology, looking at the effects that this polarized political environment is having on the mental health of Americans. And so far, um, you know, this is still kind of in its early stages, but the initial results certainly seem to indicate that it is having an effect, that that effect is non-trivial and it's, it's very negative. And the other thing that, the, the other big takeaway that I've got up here, you know, an impact of increased polarization on the broader political environment is the declining role of information. It's ironic that we live in an era where information is cheap. Um, I mean, we literally have access to pretty much all of uh, humankind's knowledge floating around in our pockets on a smart machine these days. And less and less of it is having any effect on our attitudes except to reinforce our tribal political beliefs. And, you know, if the if the facts don't back your side, you know, given how easy information is to come by these days, it's easy to find a set of facts that, that will fit your, um, uh, you know, preconceived notions of what's going on in the political world. So just to back up those 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 key weight takeaways and, and those claims, I, I just want to share a few things with you. And, and the first one is, is these are results from a study that we did a few years ago where we took a national survey and we were basically just straight up asking people, you know, you know how stressed out do you get by politics? Um, does uh, politics, do you ever do things that you regret because of politics? Do you ever engage in sort of like um, obsessive compulsive doom scrolling on social media because of politics? And the results were kind of eye-opening. And, and this particular study was covered in um, you know, a number of media outlets. For example, the New York Times uh, covered it. And, you know, and, and, and this was because some of the numbers were kind of shocking. I mean, if our survey is accurate, and we replicated it twice after this and got pretty similar results, so we're pretty convinced it's accurate is astonishing numbers of American adults are negatively affected by politics in terms of their mental, social, and, and physical health. You know, nearly 100 million people say that they are stressed out by politics. One of the things that really shocked me is, 
you know, uh, 10 or 11 million people, um, uh, uh, American adults, essentially say that they considered suicide because of, of, of politics. And when we first found when we first found that result, I didn't believe it. I just flat out didn't believe it. I was like, that that can't be correct. That five percent of American adults have actually contemplated suicide or had suicidal ideation because of political disagreement. But we've since done this survey two more times and found exactly the same result. So maybe it's maybe it's true. Um, it's, you know, a second piece of uh, uh, data to sort of like back up those takeaways that I was, was talking about is, is gridlock. Um, increasingly, what you see in Congress and increasingly what you see in state legislatures is party line voting. I mean, if you go back to the, the, the 50s and, and the 60s, you know, you'd see a party line vote and a party line vote just means that all the Democrats vote with the Democrats and all the Republicans vote with the Republicans and, and there's no cross party voting. You'd see roughly 40, 50 percent of the time you'd see a party line vote. So half the time there was no there was a lot of cross party voting going on. These days, it's 60, 70 percent or even higher. In some recent years in Congress, it's gotten as high as 90 percent. So this is evidence of, of, of the, the compromise is increasingly hard to come by. And especially when you've got a divided government, what you get is gridlock. If no one is willing to break party ranks and vote cross party on, on some sort of like compromise bill or, or, or agenda, it's just hard for government to get anything done. And as I've already mentioned a couple of times, you see this down on the state level too. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone has heard of the red state, blue state phenomenon um, because liberals and conservatives are not evenly distributed geographically. Basically what you see are some states that tend to be conservative dominant, some states that tend to be liberal dom dominant, and increasingly those states are pursuing very different policy agendas and I've got a couple of examples up on the slide, you know, taxes, abortion rights have been a big thing in the news um, ever since the Dodds decision uh, striking down Roe and uh, the constitutional right to a, 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 a abortion. Another big one that's been in the news lately is educational curriculum with what Ron DeSantis is doing down in, in Florida. But the bottom line is, is what you see are conservative states and liberal states moving in very different directions policy-wise, and not only moving in different directions policy-wise, they're essentially doing this by pointing at the other as a, you know, effectively morally bankrupt way to, to run a government. And I mean, I've got, you know, uh, the pictures up there, Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, and Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, who are increasingly taking pot shots at each other in, in kind of like a nasty and, and personal way. You know, what you're doing policy wise is not just something that I disagree with. It is, is something that is, you know, a matter of right and wrong and you are in the wrong and I am in the right. One of the other things that we see as a result of this is instability. Because people have increasingly divided into these two, you know, partisan tribes, there's just not that many people left in the middle anymore, you know, to constitute a swing median vote. And what this means is all you have to do is move a few percentage points of the electorate and you can get massive shifts and government in terms of policy and its attitudes towards the problems and the issues that the United States face. And the best example of that is what's happened in the last couple of presidential elections. You know, uh, Donald Trump won in 2016 essentially because of 100,000 votes in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. That effectively was his margin of victory. Um, and if you look at uh, 2016, what put Biden over the top was those same three states where he won by a margin of roughly a quarter of a million out of uh, 15 million cast. Basically, all you, you know, the control of the White House rests on a few swing states. I mean, no presidential candidate is campaigning in Texas. 
Um, no presidential uh, candidate is really campaigning in California because everyone knows which way those states are going to vote and where those electoral college votes are going to go. It depends on a small handful of swing states. And it's not just a small handful of swing states. It's a tiny handful of voters in those swing states that can make a massive difference to how the government is approaching the problems that our society faces. So how did we get here? You know, I'm painting a pretty grim picture. So, um, you know, what happened? And there's, um, you know, what I've got up here is, I mean, this is a, a pretty crude explanation. I'm just hitting the highlights. This is a complex issue and it's a multi-causal uh, phenomenon. And I totally get that. But a, a, you know, a rough, quick and reasonably accurate answer to why we got so polarized is something like this is, you know, beginning in the 1980s, arguably in the 1970s, political parties, which historically, you know, at, at least since World War II, have been fairly non-ideological, started to get really ideological. Republicans became conservative and Democrats became uh, liberal. In the late 80s, and especially beginning in the 1990s, you started to see elites begin to break norms. And, you know, we see this today, uh, you know, most prominently in things like, you know, Donald Trump refusing to cede uh, or recognize that he lost an election. But those sort of massive breaks of norms started way before that, you know, and, and political scientists really start to date this beginning in the 1990s. And those sorts of changes um, domestically in the United States political environment also happened in a larger global environment where, you know, economies were really changing pretty rapidly. Capital and labor were moving across um, uh, nation state boundaries uh, pretty rapidly. And that created some winners and losers that kind of like scrambled politics and made people uh, in many ways more tribal. And I'll talk about that uh, just a little bit more in a minute. And then on top of that, you essentially had the rise of bespoke media. Um, you know, you know, it used to be three or four networks that we all got our news from and we didn't have the internet. And now um, we've got multiple uh, uh, news and information sources. And those news and information sources increasingly tell us what we want to hear because that's that's how they make money. They're audience uh, driven um, uh, media companies. And all of this adds up to a political environment that not only can do is conducive to political polarization, but in many ways is driving political polarization. And I'll, you know, give an example of this. And you know, first, by looking at the United States Senate, which arguably is the least polarized branch of the United States, United States government. It's certainly less polarized than um, the House of Representatives. If you look at the makeup of the United States Senate in 1980, you've got people sitting in there like Jake Javits who's a Republican from New York, whose policy attitudes today would make him a pretty liberal Democrat. You will not find somebody like Jake Javits in the Republican Party, so, well, at least not as an elected official in the Republican Party anymore. You know, you jump up to contemporary times and the most quote unquote liberal Republican in the United States Senate is probably somebody like Susan Collins. And Susan Collins voted with the Trump administration two thirds of the time. She voted for, um, you know, the conservative Supreme Court justices. Um, and, and she's called the, you know, the liberal Republican. And if you flip to the other side of the aisle, in 1980, you've got people like Herman Talmadge, who was a, uh, uh, you know, fr from Georgia and a former governor. He was a segregationist and he was in the Democratic Party. And it's it's hard to imagine, you know, anyone with that those sort of viewpoints being in uh, elective office in either party these days, but definitely not as a Democrat. Probably the most conservative Democrat in the United States Senate right now is, is Joe Manchin. And Joe Manchin votes with the Biden administration 100% of the time. And you can really see this um, if you look at the shift in uh, representative change in the South. You know, the South was historically a politically conservative place, but it was also historically a, uh, you know, a bastion of Democratic uh, votes. And that has just completely changed with the 
um, uh, realignment of the parties around uh, ideological beliefs. In 1980, you know, the 16 states that I've got up there that, you know, most mostly are old Dixie. What you had is they were overwhelmingly Democrat in 1980, and 10 of them, two thirds of them had split representation, you know, one Democrat, one Republican. You shift to 2022, they're overwhelmingly represented by Republicans and conservative Republicans at that, and only one of those states has split representation. And this is a fairly radical change. And keep in mind, I picked the United States Senate deliberately because that is the least polarized federal institution there is. But it's not just sort of like polarization in the sense of reflecting policy disagreement or even sort of like emotional dislike of each other. You know, some elites are actively promoting this by breaking democratic norms. And one of the reasons we in political science date this you know trend towards breaching democratic norms amongst political elites dates back to this guy and i'm sure some of you recognize um uh, newt gingrich if you were paying attention to politics in the 1990s one of the things that, that gingrich did was deliberately set up a campaign to train um uh, republican candidates for office to speak in a certain way about their tribe and, you know, use uh, positive words like courage, crusade, dream, duty, and power about Republicans, and deliberately train them to use contrasting language with their opponents, you know, anti-child, anti-flag, betray, bizarre, cheat. This was a systematic way to um, uh, polarize, to define the political, the opposite political team in emotionally negative, uh, negative ways. And those big economic shifts, I mean, they, they scrambled politics in the sense that you had sort of like the decline of or the deindustrialization of the Midwest. Um, you had a big exodus from the family farm and the rise of big ag. And this left an awful lot of people feeling like they were, uh, you know, with some justification, like they were the losers in globalization and that they were being unfairly targeted by economic and cultural elites in the sense that things were changing really, really rapidly. And they felt that their views were not only being ignored, but in many ways denigrated. And, and they thought things were changing too fast and somebody should stick up for them and slow things down. But some people sort of like, you know, felt like things weren't changing enough. I mean, you had, um, you know, LGBTQ people, um, uh, you know, pushing for change. Um, you had the rise of the uh, Black Lives uh, Matter movement. And there was frustration amongst these groups, not that the system was changing uh, too slow and that the culture was changing too rapidly, but that it wasn't changing fast enough. And, you know, there was a deep entrenched systemic bias that remained that was disadvantaging them. And the end result of this is, you know, it, it pushes people into two camps. And I mean, these two camps are fairly identifiable by groups now, you know, the working class, which used, you know, overwhelmingly used to be a Democratic constituency is now effectively a Republican constituency. And the college educated, which used to be more of a Republican constituency is now overwhelmingly a, uh, or increasingly a, uh, a Democratic constituency. And, the, the, you know, you, we've split into these two tribes and we're looking at each other and effectively we're saying to each other, you're too extreme. You've changed and you've changed for the worse. And it's not helped. Those, those views of each other are not helped by the sources of information that we consume. Most media outfits now are speaking to a single audience. I mean, the poster child for this is, is Fox News, which is, you know, considered the house organ of the, the political right. And indeed, 93% of Fox's viewers are registered Republicans. But the same is pretty much true of the New York Times. I mean, it only speaks to Democrats. 91% of the readers of the New York Times are, are Democrats. And these media companies have vested interests in, you know, telling their audience what they want to what they want to hear. And this is even before you get into sort of like the explosion of social media where, um, you know, non-thinking algorithms push stories and information your way. 
in a way that is deliberately, um, uh, you know, trying to engage you emotionally um, to get views and clicks. And, um, you know, political scientists who have been looking at this have gotten pretty concerned about it. And, you know, there's, you know, not every study, but most studies find that it, it doesn't matter how you look at it, social media plays a significant role in driving political polarization. So, you know, just to summarize what I've talked up so far, um, you know, it, 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 it's kind of depressing, but I think this is, you know, basically just an empirical observation is polarization is, is happening, it's getting worse, um, it's happening both at the elite level and at the mass level, it's creating a lot of problems, you know, with social conflict, anxiety, and resentment. It's leading to gridlock and instability in, in the government. The reason that this happened, there's there's lots of reasons, uh, you know, many of which I've just gone through. And the end result, what we end up with is a uh, political system and a political process that is increasingly characterized by us, the goodies, against them, the baddies. And this is a bad place to be in because political scientists who have studied uh, polarization um, in, in, in democracies have repeatedly found that it leads to, you know, bad places, uh, civil unrest, violence, a slide towards authoritarianism. It's, it's kind of scary, scary stuff. And what I've got highlighted here is a, uh, you know, just some quotes from a report done by the Carnegie Foundation. But there is sort of like a, a, a hopeful coda there at, at the end where it says, you know, there are some things we could still do to mitigate and, and maybe even uh, reduce the level of, of polarization in our political system. So what might that be? I mean, is there a way that we can build bridges rather than, than, than blowing them up? And I think this is a question that um, still remains to be answered. But I, I think there are, you know, we don't have to despair. I, I think there are some things that we can look to um, with, with some hope on what is, you know, uh, a very difficult um, uh, uh, issue that our society is grappling with. And one is to actually, um, you know, uh, take a little bit of pride in and no small ration of relief in our institutions. I mean, the United States political institutions have taken a heck of a beating over the past five or six years. And you know, they wobbled a little bit and they haven't always functioned the way that everyone would like them to. But for the most part, they've held. I mean, James Madison and his crew at the Constitutional Convention designed a pretty good system. And, you know, one of the things is, is that people still have an enormous amount of respect for that system. And a lot of people at the mass and the elite level are committed to it as a value and a norm. I mean, one of the things that people should, you know, not forget is that some of the heroes of the 2020 election were Republicans who kicked against their own party and doing things like certifying elections in Georgia and Arizona, which you know, was a, they were doing their jobs, they were committed to their system, but that was not a small, it took no small amount of political courage to do that when you're getting phone calls from the president of the United States asking you to do something else. But, you know, other than just having faith in the institutions that exist, there probably are some changes that we could make. You know, an example that several people are pointing towards is ranked choice voting. So the way we vote um, uh, these days, at least when we get to a general election, we walk into a voting booth, we're handed a ballot, and you can vote for the Republican candidate, or you can vote for the Democratic candidate, and you can write in somebody else if you want. Ranked choice voting is uh, you can um, uh, you know write in your first choice, you can write in your second, second choice, you can write in your third choice, and you can write in your fourth, fifth, and sixth choice if that, that many people are running. And the way ranked choice voting works is you need 50% of the first votes to win. And if no one gets 50% of those first votes, the person with the least amount of first votes drops out and their second preferences get redistributed. And one of the things that uh, a number of studies have shown is that ranked choice voting tends to moderate political candidates because political candidates quickly intuit that they may need those second and third choice votes. 
and they can't get those second and third choice votes if they run kind of like an extremist campaign that is appealing only to a highly ideological base. One of the other things that we could do, you know, rather than relying on some big mass uh, 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 institutional change is take a look at our own beliefs as individuals. I mean, this is something that we can do as individuals. Um, you know, one of the things that we could educate ourselves on is that our views, our perceptions of the, our political op opposites are often very inaccurate. And rather than being tribal, um, you know, we could extend the principle of charity a little bit more often. We could say that someone who disagrees with me political politically does so in good faith. I mean, they have a principled reason for uh, principled reason for doing that. And I think if more people did that, if more people chose to do that, we obviously would have less um, uh, polarized politics. And just to give you an example of how perceptions really aren't reality, um, opinions, uh, or at least political attitudes, policy attitudes, haven't changed the way that many people believe they have. What I've got up on the slide now is, uh, you know, this comes from a study that came out a couple of years ago. And if you look in the middle of this graph, this is where uh, all the attitudes were, uh, where they've got it scaled on all of these issues in 1972. And what they're looking at is the percentage change in those um, uh, attitudes in the intervening 40 years. And if, you know, if the, these black dots move to the right, it means that Democrats uh, grew more liberal. And if they, um, if these black dots are moving up, it means that Republicans got more liberal. And what you can see is mostly attitudes shifted towards being more liberal. You know, Republicans got a little bit more conservative on things like immigration and abortion, but mostly their attitudes uh, uh, got a little bit more liberal. The big change is that Democrats became a lot more liberal in their political attitudes. And, you know, these kind of like, you know, misclassification of the attitudes of our opposites leads to what some political scientists call false polarization. In other words, we're creating polarization out of our own misperceptions um, by, you know, having an empirically false idea of the attitudes and beliefs of people on, on the other side. And just, just really quickly, I mean, here's some evidence of this from a, a couple of studies. So if you ask uh, Republicans, for example, you know, do you agree that properly controlled immigration can be good for America? 85% of Republicans agree with that statement. Uh, if you ask Democrats to estimate how many Republicans agree with that statement, they say 52%, and that creates a perception gap of 33%. Democrats have a really wildly incorrect view of Republicans' view on, on immigration. And the same exists for a bunch of uh, uh, other attitudes. And the same goes the other way. Um, if you ask, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, Democrats, um, uh, you ask them whether they agree or disagree with the statement, most police are bad people, 85% of Democrats disagree with that statement. If you ask Republicans, uh, you know, to what extent Democrats disagree with that statement, they say 48% less than her. So again, you've got a 37.0% gap. The bottom line is, is that both sides are completely misperceiving the actual beliefs that the other side has. And I'll just skip that side in the slide in the name of time. I can see like most academics, I'm starting to ramble on and, and, and get a little bit past my time. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, this, this notion of false polarization is that um, uh, seeing is misbelieving. We're driving ourselves apart and becoming more tribal on incorrect perceptions of the, the other side. And so, you know, one way uh, in, in which we could perhaps mitigate um, uh, polarization is that if people like me did um, a, a better job, you know, at, at their vocations, you know, simply putting out information and educating, um, uh, you know, not just the next generation of students, but through talks like this is, you know, pointing out that, you know, some of the attitudes that you have um, about your political opposites may be, um, you know, 
not as real as you think they are. And that, you know, if you extended the principle of charity and were willing to, you know, try to meet some people in the me uh, in in the middle. If you were willing to step outside of your your media bubble, um, maybe we could pull back a little bit from the tribalism and and politics. So I'll I'll stop there. You know, the I think the main takeaways that I wanted you to take from 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 the talk were that you know polarization is not just policy disagreement. It is you know the affective polarization is real. Uh, this this tribalism that is uh, rooted in emotional dislike of each other. Polarization is definitely increasing at the elite level and at the mass level. Um, it's promoting conflict, it's promoting instability. Um, there are a lot of causes for this, um, um, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, we're much more polarized now than we were even a few years ago. And along with all the bad news, there are some good news takeaways is, you know, polarization, as bad as it is, might not be as bad as we perceive it. Um, our institutions, at least so far, are holding. I mean, they are still operating in the way that they are designed to do, even though they're starting to creak a little bit. And you don't have to feel helpless as an individual here. I mean, you can be part of the solution um, uh, as well as as well as part of the problem. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop right there. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to try and try and field them. All right, thank you, Kevin. We've got a few questions from the chat. Our first one is, how would things change on electoral votes if all states split them like Nebraska versus winner take all? Yeah, that's a good question. I you've got me a little flat footed in the sense that I I haven't uh, totaled that up. I mean, one of the obvious big changes would be that, you know, I said that you don't see presidential candidates um, uh, campaigning in California or or Texas places like that. You'd probably see a lot more of that because you know even in states that are. Um, you know, one party dominant I mean, in Texas is Republican dominant, California is, is Democratic dominant. They both have, you know, a, a group of congressional districts that are from the out party. And those could become really valuable if uh, electoral uh, uh, votes were split like Nebraska. And uh, I, I believe it's Maine who also splits votes the way we do. All right, our next question uh, says, I don't understand how the working class can go Republican when GOP has historically been anti-union. Has the working class given up on unions? I'm not sure if the working class has given up on union. And I mean, you you see some of this in sort of like the populist uh, movement that, that Donald Trump uh, heralded. I mean, you know, I don't think there's an easy answer um, in, in terms of why the working class is increasingly shifting to their political loyalties to Republican. Part of it is certainly on cultural uh, uh, issues. The working class increasingly seems to think that Democrats reflect you know, college educated elites who who kind of look down on them and, you know, view their, you know, rightly or wrongly, they 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 perceive themselves as being viewed with a little bit of contempt by 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 Democrats. They look at, you know, people like AOC, people like that, and say, you know, that's um uh you know, that's not not for me. Um but I, I don't think that the working class has given up on unions, at least not totally. Uh, I, I think the answer there is probably more cultural. And one of the reasons I, I, I say that is that, you know, one of the interesting trends in political loyalties is, you know, Donald Trump's vote share amongst racial and ethnic minorities increased in the last presidential election which you know, kind of shocked some political scientists. But as, as near as we can tell, basically what's happening is though th that's working class people who are sort of like rejecting the cultural stands of uh, the, the Democratic Party and then shifting to, uh, you know, shifting their loyalties to the Republican Party because they simply, for, you know, they feel more at home there because of, uh, you know, basically what amount to cultural values. All right. Our next question is about some of the graphs that you showed. A previous graph of elites showed Republican elites got more conservative while Democratic elites stayed the same. Now in another graph, are you saying that Democrats got more liberal? 
It's not that, well, there's two different graphs there, right? One was democratic elites and the other was sort of like uh, mass opinion and mass opinion in um, uh, uh, Democrats has moved in a much more liberal direction. And the elites reflect that, not necessarily in the sense that the mean ideology of Democratic members of Congress has shifted massively to the left, but the dispersion around that mean is, is tightened up. Basically, you know, there's not that many kind of like moderate center left people left in the Democratic Party, at least compared to, you know, a decade or two ago. I, I think that's where that shows up. All right, our next question. Do you agree that since 2020, the legal system has contained polarization better than the political system? That is, the courts have upheld the law without regard to party, whereas many Republicans are still playing down the insurrection of January 6th and the danger of Trump to democracy. It is the courts that have held the line, not the political parties. Yeah, I, th I think the answer to that would depend on your perspective on a particular court case. Um, I mean, I, I think generally speaking, especially in, in terms of sort of like how the courts have handled handled the prosecutions on the January 6 insurrection, certainly support that perspective that was just uh, expressed in that question. But if you look on, um, let's say, the Dodds decision overturning Roe versus Wade, um, I mean, you know, the you know people on the right were like, finally, the Supreme Court is. Is, is holding the line and, you know, upholding the Constitution and people on the left are like, oh, my God, you're taking away a constitutional right. And this is ideological and partisan capture of the courts. So I think some of that is, is dependent upon, you know, what particular issue we're talking about, you know, what level of court and what decision the court is making. Can you comment on voter apathy and the pervasive feeling of helplessness? Yeah, I can comment on it, but I'm not sure what what you want me to say. I mean, there's a long tradition in, in political scientists of, you know, voting is irrational. I mean, the, the chances of you making a difference in the outcome of an election is, is, is pretty small. And, you know, one of the big puzzles that political scientists have been trying to figure out for the past 40 or 50 years is, is why people um, uh, bother to, to vote at all. Um, you know, I mean, this is kind of a depressing thing to say, but I mean, I think some of that apathy is justified. I mean, if you're at the average voter sitting out there, um, you know, unless you're emotionally attached to, you know, one set of political beliefs or the other, I mean, it can seem... You know, I mean, Congress looks like a partisan sandbox, right, with people pointing at fingers at each other and, you know, trying to score political points. I mean, who can get excited and enthusiastic uh, about that? I mean, you know, on, I, I guess on a more hopeful thing is, you know, one way to combat apathy is, is just to get involved. I mean, I, I think some people are kind of surprised at how easy it is to get involved in local politics. I mean, because you don't have to do much. I mean, you can show up to a meeting, you can spend 10 bucks at a fundraiser, those sorts of things. And getting involved in the process, I think, gives a perspective and a viewpoint that, you know, leads, is more likely to lead people to the conclusion that, you know, this, this can make a difference. Um, and, you know, it, it is something worth doing. And I mean, I know I'm kind of rambling on this answer because this is something we're struggling with right now because, boy, I, I mean, college students are, you know, you know, especially post-pandemic, they're, 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 they're not nearly as engaged as they used to be. Do you think the political opinions of academics contribute to the political polarization of young adults? Oh, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, I think in most cases, uh, if they are contributing, it's not deliberate. Um, we've had, we have a teaching roundtable in our department, and this is an issue that we've we've discussed a number of times, is, you know, how do we handle 
some of the issues in the classroom and, you know, where you, you know, it's Nebraska. So we've got plenty of conservative students. We've got plenty of, of, of liberal students. Um, and, you know, at least from the, our perception as educators, it is a very different perception if you're a student or parent. I mean, what we're worried about is the perceptions of the students in the sense it doesn't matter what we say, they can take it out of context. Um, I dealt with one issue where, as the chair of a department, where we had an instructor where students were literally keeping track of how many reading assignments they had from the New York Times versus the Wall Street Journal, sort of like as an index of... Uh, uh, you know, how biased this this professor is. And I know this professor, this professor is, you know, the, the students are reading something there that, that, that there's no there there. And and how we handle that issue is, you know, unfortunately, a lot of it lands on is like, you know, we try to avoid super controversial things because, you know, 10 seconds of video taken on an iPhone in a classroom can end your career these days. And it's it's sad to say, but that's that's just the reality of it. What is the impact of different laws and changes? Roe versus Wade, it is still the individual's choice to have an abortion. And for some things like guns, you don't need them. Nebraska needs to be careful as the state Senate is becoming much more conservative in many ways, and those are not for personal choice. In many ways, they are going for anti-choice. I see it as a shift for control, almost like Russia and China versus democracy. How do we get people to focus on individual choices? Yeah, I'm, yeah, and I, I don't have uh, any easy answers there. I mean, I think I would have a slightly different take on it. And the, what we're seeing in the Nebraska legislature is what we're seeing um, in a lot of other state legislatures these days, which is increasing polarization. I mean, even though it's a nonpartisan legislature, I mean, you, you don't exactly have to be a... Um, you know, you, you don't need a PhD in political science to figure out who's the liberals and who's the conservatives, who's the Republicans and, and who's the Democrats. Um, and it's, you know, in an increasingly polarized institution, it's harder to meet compromise on issues that are really controversial. And I mean, you mentioned things like, you know, gun control and abortion. I mean, those are hard enough in the best of circumstances where opposing sides are extending the principle of charity to the other side. And in a highly charged political environment that's that's affectively polarized, I mean, you know, even a state senator in a nonpartisan legislature that steps away from the party line can be ostracized by their party and indeed by their constituents. And that's that's just, you know, that, that's just a tough situation to be in. And actually, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, brought that up about the Nebraska legislature. Because even though things are increasingly polarized in the Nebraska state legislature, they are less polarized than in other state legislatures. I mean, the unicameral, I think, is something as a state we should be proud of, the nonpartisan unicam. Um, when I came to Nebraska, I was very much in the party line of political science, which uh, nonpartisan institutions are not good because um, voters you know, often the only real piece of, of actionable information they have about a candidate in the voting booth is their um, their party uh, affiliation. But I, I think Nebraska even <laughs> now still allows um, a, a degree of cross-party cooperation that, I mean, although there's, there's not much of it, especially compared to past years, there's still more of it compared to other states. Being charitable and trying to see the viewpoint of the other seems unrealistic, at least in today's political and social environment. How do we get people to exercise that charity? Will voices from the pulpit help? Um, yeah, possibly. I mean, I'm not a theologian, and I'm not sure what the, the, the rules and regulations are. I mean, I, I certainly don't want to suggest that any minister be in the position of, 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 of offending their, their, their congregation, but... I mean, you know, find people who think different from you politically. I mean, I'm an academic. I, I spend my entire working career around people who are predominantly on the left and often on the ex extreme left. And they're good people. They're well-intentioned. They're principled people. You know, I have a lot of family and friends in Texas who are Trump voters. 
um, who are politically completely the opposite, and they are warming, welcoming to me, um, you know, and, and their views, you know, being close to them and getting to see the world through their eyes it just gives you a little bit more sympathy for them. Now, you know, we all run into people on one side or the other where it's like, it's my way or the highway. You know, only I, I hold the moral high ground and anyone who disagrees with me, I'm not just having a policy disagreement with, they are, um, uh, you know, they are immoral. They are taking a non-principled uh, stand and they need to be brought to the light. I mean, and honestly, it's just hard to engage with those kind of people because you know, they're information resistant. And the, it, it's hard to extend the principle of charity to people who won't reciprocate it. I will say, though, it's been my experience, and, and I've tried to do this, honestly, with, you know, very, very different groups of people. And I found, for the most part, if you express a little empathy, you, you don't have to uh, uh, express agreement. And you try to keep emotion out of it. And you try to clarify, you know, and like in a curious way, not in an accusatory way, sort of like try to understand why do you believe what you what you do. I, I find that that can, um, you know, lead to some pretty fruitful and interesting conversations. And it is hard to do. It, it is hard to do and it doesn't always work. But I, you know, I speaking to me personally, I, it's worth taking the risk. How does the increase of independent, non-affiliated voters impact the issues and metrics presented here? Uh, well, th 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 that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that political scientists have generally found is that non-affiliated vo non voters are often more ideological than affiliated voters. Um, you know, a lot of quote unquote independents um, are independent because they're conservative and think the Republican Party isn't conservative enough or they're liberals and they think the Democratic Party isn't liberal enough. If you look at their voting patterns, um, independents often look very much like uh, partisan voters. The number of true independents, people who split their ticket, that's been steadily shrinking for, for, for quite a while. Is there any possibility for a significant middle or third party to be formed and why? That would be really hard to do because of the way that our system is set up, um, you know, and a winner takes all first past the post system. Um, it's really hard for a third party to get established because when they're getting established, it's really hard for them to win enough votes in a first past the post system to have any any impact. And if a third party does start to have an impact, what's happened historically is the Republican or the Democratic Party pivots and takes on those issues and uh, effectively swallows the independent party's policy agenda. You know, could that happen? I mean, I mean, the, there are increasingly sort of like, um, you know, talks, especially amongst disaffected Republicans, like, you know, the David Brooks of the world, uh, those those sort of people. I mean, they're clearly starting to flirt with that idea, but those people are, you know, they're smarter than I am, and, and they can figure out that the odds are against them. Um, you know, because the bottom line is the way that our system is established, uh, it, it's not kind to third parties. I mean, you would effectively... I think have to switch to a proportional votes uh, system where the number of seats that you got was proportional to the number of votes your party got in the, in the election for the third parties to have a real, real chance. So if that's going to happen, it's probably going to happen when a state uh, adopts some sort of proportional vote system for a state legislature. That, that would at least give um, third parties a fighting chance. But I don't see the possibilities of that, you know, realistically happening in the in the foreseeable future. Do people like George Soros and the Koch brothers get too much credit or blame for political polarization? Yeah, both. Uh, I, I think it's both. I mean, uh, I ha have this discussion with uh, students all the time. You know, the George Soros and the Koch brothers cannot buy your vote. Your vote is yours. You can access, you have that right. 
and uh, you know you don't have to sell it to the Koch brothers um, or, or to George Soros. You know, but that's a little naive in the sense of what they can buy is they can buy a louder voice in the political arena than the average voter can. And, you know, given the Supreme Court uh, decision in Citizens versus United, where money is essentially treated as speech, um, you know, if the Koch brothers want to try and, uh, you know, have a loud voice in a Nebraska election, even though, you know, they don't live in Nebraska. They're not going to be living with the consequences of uh, policies made by the state legislature. They can do it because they simply have the resources resources to do, uh, you know, to do that. And the only real sort of like uh, bulwark against that um, that 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 potential influence is, you know, the vigilance of the citizen. You know, you. You can't be influenced to vote one way if you don't want to be influenced to vote one way. Do you think that it would be desirable for the University of Nebraska to take a larger role in educating Nebraskans about the degree of misperception and the views of people in the other parties? Give Professor Smith a megaphone outside the classroom, but across the state. <laughs> Well, I think you'd probably get me in trouble. I'm not sure I want to be standing up on that stage with that megaphone. I think I'd probably get it from uh, both sides. I think, but in all seriousness, I, I think there's, two, I'd have two potential answers to that question. One is I think we could do a better uh, job of educating people inside the university. Um, you know, I, I've been teaching Introduction to American Politics for 30 years, and one of the first, the first things I do on the first day in class is I give everybody a test and I don't tell the students this, but it's a citizenship test. It's the same citizenship test that, that ICE gives to immigrants being naturalized. An astonishing number of our students fail that. Um, so one of the things is, is we need to do a better job of uh, ed educating our young people who go on to be citizens. Um, you know, this is completely self-interested, so it, it has to be uh, taken with that in mind, but there is no required civics course at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln or at any of the Nebraska universities. You can go through college and not be taught anything about the political system, which I, I just think is, I, I think it's appalling. And, and again, I'm the chair of the political science department, so obviously I have a large, large stake in that. So take it for what it's worth. But if we, if we can educate people inside the university, it, it's going to be hard to educate people outside the university. But the second part of my answer to that question is, should we be doing a better job and engaging people outside the universities, external constituencies, you know, just regular voters? Absolutely, we, we should be doing that. People like me should not just be speaking in lecture series like this. We should be at the Lions Club out in Shadron. And not in the sense of, you know, I want to be careful here, not in the sense that, oh, I'm descending from the ivory tower to bestow my, my hard-won wisdom upon you, uh, uh, you know, you, you unknowing regular folks, but simply to is kind of like an educative uh, uh, function and, and, and to share information and to extend the principle of charity and, you know, hopefully give an example of how that can be constructively done. This next one is a comment. Uh, it seems to me that Nebraska Republican state senators are taking their cues, strategies, focus legislation from national groups, almost like a conspiracy copycat entity. I don't think the Democratic Party is doing that. The upcoming fight is that they do not want a nonpartisan elected Senate nor any other Nebraska leading office in spite of or because Nebraska is a Republican state due mostly to rural versus sharp urban sharp spreads. Well, one of the things that I'd say in response to that is this is a phenomenon that political scientists have been studying for a while. Um, uh, th there's a really good book out. I forget the title now, but the author's name is Jake Grumbach um, on, on the nationalization of politics. You know, Tip O'Neill has this famous aphorism that all politics is local, and that's not true anymore. That, that's just not true, is if you're running for, you know, dog catcher in uh, Los Angeles, um, you're parroting, um, you know, whatever the national party talking points are. I, I think that is affecting 
both parties. And in Nebraska, you know, it, it may be more obvious with the Republican side, simply because it's a Republican dominant state. But I'm pretty confident if you were in a Democratic state, if, we, if you were living in California or something like that, you know, politics on the left is increasingly nationalized, just as politics on the right is. And, and that's a shame, because, you know, the issues that are faced subnationally are not necessarily the same ones that um, are of primary interest uh, uh, nationally and sort of like realigning a system that was designed to push government, you know, real governance closer to the people, you know, uh, uh, aligning it vertically along um, partisan and ideological lines, I think is, I, I, I don't think that's good for the system. Should we go back to limiting funding spent by anyone, limit the amount of money politicians can raise, make it a real time sink for politicians to raise money? I think in my own personal opinion, maybe not go back to limiting it, but certainly go back, going back to, to regulating it. I mean, there's a lot of what they call dark money floating around in there. Nobody knows where the, you know, it's sort of like in the public, no one really knows where the money's coming from or what the intentions are behind it. Um, you know, the the stuff that uh, Russ Feingold, a former senator from Wisconsin, and John McCain, the Arizona senator, were doing. In my own personal opinion, I, th I, I think we should go back to that. The bottom line, though, is, is I can tell you we're not going to do that. There's, the Supreme Court has decided on, on that question. And unless, you know, there's some come to hallelujah moment uh, uh, amongst the conservative wing on the Supreme Court, I, I, I don't I, I don't think we're going to. Um, uh, go back to uh, any situation in the foreseeable future where the uh, Congress or any state legislature is, you know, significantly and tightly regulating campaign funding. There's a comment in the chat with a link showing that in states that split their electoral votes that it has benefited Republicans over Democrats in the last several elections, if you want to comment on that. Well, you know, facts are facts are facts, but that's not always the case, though. I think Obama got an electoral vote out of Nebraska um, in 2012, I think. I, I wouldn't swear to that, but the, I, I can certainly think of an example or two, even if I can't remember the exact years where, you know, a Democrat was extracting an electoral vote out of a state that was predominantly Republican. So, I, you know, I. I haven't got the numbers in front of me. I, I, I won't contest the the assertion that it's been more beneficial to Republicans overall, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been a, a beneficial to Democrats, at least occasionally. All right. looks like we've got one last question here in the chat. It says, civics used to be taught in high schools. Isn't it taught in high schools anymore? It is taught in high school. And, you know, I've actually given talk to the Nebraska State uh, Civic Teachers Association, and uh, I, I I don't want any of my comments to be construed as throwing shade on that group. Those teachers are doing a phenomenal job under some pretty trying circumstances um, uh, uh, these days. Um, but this is not a subject that. Um, you know, if you take the average 16 or 17 year old, this is not a subject that naturally engages them. I mean, even with some of the best teachers in, in, in the world uh, teaching it, um, you know, the difference between being 16 and 17 and being 20 is, I mean, that's not a long time in years, but that's a big time in awareness of what's going on in the, the, the political world. And I think you know, uh, high school civics is like a lot of other classes in, in, uh, in, in high school. I mean, you come out of there, you're there because you're being forced to be there. Um, you know, you're not quite sure how to connect what you're being taught to what's meaningful in, in your life. And, you know, you get out into the world in your 19 or 20, and some of that started to sink in. And I, I really think we could you know, do a better job if we're catching them at that, at, at that age. I'd, I'd at least like to Put that hypothesis to the test. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is we could, you know, help a little. It certainly wouldn't hurt. 
There, there's another comment, Bob, that's just come up in the chat. Yep. It says, if you aren't speaking at Rotary and other service clubs, I think this week's session especially would be a great way to make citizens aware of the differences in perception versus reality and what both parties actually think on various topics. Well, that's that, that that's sweet of you to say. And I mean, you know, and effectively by doing these sort of outreach uh, things, I mean, if there's any small way in which, you know, people like me can contribute to um, you know, for what lack of a better term is depolarization. I mean, you know, I'm not interested in this is what I tell students and students increasingly simply don't believe this from their political science professors anymore. It's like, you know, I, I tell them sincerely, honestly, I, I, I don't care what your political beliefs are. I, I don't care whether you're a liberal or a conservative, whether you're pro-choice, anti-choice, whether you're pro-gun, anti-gun. I, I, I don't care. I literally do not care. What I care very deeply about is how you think about politics and how you approach politics. And, you know, you know, a, a good informed citizen is someone who doesn't go, wander around saying like, my tribe is right. And if you're with the other tribe, you're a bad person who's trying to do bad things and wishing bad things on my community and my, and my nation. You know, I, I want you to think a little more critically and analytically about politics. And I also want you to think about it in a philosophical way that allows you to uh, take some of the emotions out of it and extend the principle of charity to people who disagree with you politically. I mean, and, and I mean, that's not just me. I mean, uh, Jack Comer can back me up on this. Is I mean, this is what we're trying to do in the classroom and, and political science. But increasingly, you're kind of like met with disbelief by students when you say that, e even though you're genuinely sincere and, and honest about it. You know, they either think you're, well, most students, it's, it's mostly conservatives thinking you're too liberal. But, you know, these days we've got liberal enough students that they, they think you're too conservative. We have about a little less than 10 minutes left. If anyone would like to uh, unmute, and, uh, and offer a comment, raise a question, please feel free to do so. Everybody should be able to unmute now and I'll also, they should be able to start video. Yes, I have a question to go back to the civics discussion. Uh, it used to be about 20 to 25% of the US population who went to college. Is that still about okay? So it, it's more than that now. I think it's okay. Around, yeah, I think it's around forty or forty-five percent who go to college, not necessarily graduate, but yeah. Okay. So there's still a majority who go out to the workforce with just a high school education. So it's that high school civics that they got, and that's all they'll get. But well, that's the group that seems to be the disenchanted population that's going to the Republicans. Yeah, and I think, I mean, and I appreciate that comment because I, I, I think there's a, a, a good deal of truth in that. And I think that's where it's incumbent on people like me to figure out ways to connect to that constituency. I mean, I, you know, and I, I always talk about my friends and, and, and family in Texas. And one of the things that I've, I've, I've found is that, you know, many of, you know, some of them went to college, but some, some of them didn't. And one of the things that I found is that, you know, people who fall into the latter category have a curiosity and they are willing to engage and willing to listen, um, you know, if it's somebody that they trust. Um, you know, if it's somebody that they're, you know, that they're, you know, pretty convinced isn't going to sort of like say, oh, yeah, well, you're a bunch of racist yahoos or, or, or whatever, but, it, you know, extend the principle of charity and engage with them on a, on, on a really meaningful way. Um, so how do we get people like me to connect with uh, those, those constituencies? I, I'm not sure I have an a, a answer to that, but, you know, count me as willing. Thank you. Uh, Dave, thank you. You showed your face. You must have something to say. Well, <clears throat> Kevin made some comment about the role of social media uh, and the influence they have on young people uh, and, and they formulating their opinions and so on. Do you have any more thoughts on, on that, Kevin? 
Yeah, well, this is sort of like an active and ongoing um, uh, area of, of, of research. Um, I, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of a guy by the name Jonathan Hype. He's written a couple of New York Times bestseller. One of them was called The Happiness Hypothesis and The Righteous Mind. But even if you've never heard of him, his big um, uh, research agenda right now is he is arguing that the rise of social media has actually had a significant causal influence on the rise in mental health problems amongst young people that you know young people are, are on social media watching these carefully curated lives that are totally unrealistic yardsticks to measure against your own uh, uh life and that there's kind of like these online mobs that are kind of like nasty to people now that you know you know when i was in high school that could be pretty vicious but when you've got it coming at you on 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 social media apparently it can be kind of overwhelming and that's relevant to political scientists because this seems to be affecting people on the left more than on the right. Um, and we're not 100% sure of, of, of why that is. Um, but, you know, this is just another example of where you see these sort of like differential impacts by politics. The impacts are negative and it's pretty easy to move back down a causal chain and not go too far and run smack into social media. One of the things that I'm doing uh, right now, David, is I'm running a set of surveys over a couple of years on our undergraduates on their social media use. And it's truly astonishing. These kids spend a lot of time. They spend, I mean, I spend too much time on social media, but but compared to some of these undergraduates, I mean, they, they are really tethered to their 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 phones um you know they're not hanging out with each other they're connecting they're connecting virtually and that's just that's that's not healthily in in in, some, in terms of a mental health perspective that's not healthy in terms of a political engagement perspective it's awfully hard to extend the principle of charity over the 250 characters on on, on twitter so yeah i mean there's a lot to be said about social media and there's a lot of research still to be done i mean there are positive aspects of social media and, and i i totally get that but but david i mean i think overall there's a general consensus at least amongst my tribe of political scientists that social media has had some pretty negative effects on politics and especially for young people and increasingly it seems especially for left-leaning young people although we're not quite sure what's going on there this is certainly a concern with People who have gray hair on the top of their head <laughs> and, and, and their views of the world. Or, or even their faces. <laughs> I can tell you, uh, Kevin, that this morning I was at the university. I was at the uh, the gym at the rec center. I went into the sauna for five minutes and there were five kids there. Every one of them was on their cell phone in the sauna. Yeah. Well, um, one of the phenomena, I've just become fascinated with it, just as you know, a social scientist observing human behavior but you know when classes end um you'll see undergraduates come out of class and a huge proportion of them the first thing they do is they pull out their phone and they're going down the hallways looking at their looking at their phone i mean you know as i said the, the your kids today are really tethered um to that i mean the, the virtual world is you know a big part of their big part of their lives and that i start that starts at age 10 it's not only university students yeah and i and i think it's hard for you know i'm i'm pushing 60 i mean i think it's hard for you know folks i i, I don't want to extend my age to the entire uh audience but of, of of what i think is our demographic i mean i mean i think it's hard for us to sort of like gain that perception that they have because they're literally experiencing the world differently than we did. Okay, uh, John Clark, you just uh, opened your face and took yourself off mute. You'd like to offer a last comment or question? I would. Um, as a lifelong educator, and I'll admit it now, I was a member of the State Department of Education for 36 years. So you can discount as much as you want, but a long-term trend, and it has been going on for a hundred years at least from world war ii on that's more than a hundred isn't it well that's what i get for being 80 
any rate, um, we tend to, and in this conversation, have also slide toward thinking that the schools, the K-12 schools, are the ones who are going to um, cause certain things to happen. And so what you get over time is that the number of hours of schooling is fixed. In Nebraska, it's 1,035 for elementary, 1,080 for education, local school district, figure out how you apportion those hours. And so every time we legislatively push one more hour of instruction into either level, we're pushing the other hours of instruction. And so you don't get to decide, well, I guess we won't teach math on, on Wednesdays in order to get this new thing. And so I would just caution everybody, the next time another problem needs to be solved, if the answer is to mess with what is taught in our government schools, think twice about that. And uh, during that twice thinking, and I don't know how to follow my own advice on this, so I'll stop after this point is that I'm not sure how else we get to audiences by convince them. The idea of infiltrating Kiwanis and Rotary, I really like. And uh, I think that's a way to go it. There is a recent article just published in the uh, Ali uh, politic insta group, instant uh, politics group. I forwarded it to it. It comes from ProPublica. And it's about a uh, group recently funded by a billionaire to a billion dollars amount. And it is has a Latin name. Um, and I'm not recalling it, but go SEO. to, pardon? It was T-E-S-E-O, wasn't it? That's close. My older by Latin isn't taking me anywhere on it, but uh, just go to ProPublica's uh, website and read that. And what I read into it, and I'm going longer than I promised, is that I've studied the history of the um, conservatively funded um, groups and so forth. And uh, this is looking like the history of somebody whose family produced beer in um, Denver or Golden, Colorado, actually. Coors. Right. Having done the major contribution to uh, the Heritage Foundation. And it paid off because their playbook of, of legislative strategies, as I understand it, at least according to at least one writer, and it's the author of Dark Money, was basically the Reagan program in his first two years. And to a certain extent, when I read the, the ProPublica article, I thought, wait a minute, I've been to this movie before. And so I would suggest everyone who's watching find that ProPublica article and take it to heart and then start looking for pieces of it to pop up. And I feel so good for having gotten to say this to so many people. So I thank you all very much. And uh, as a final comment, I was one of your delightful students uh, for the nine hours you did for uh, OSHA or uh, Ollie okay. a number of years ago. And uh, you had introduced yourself as a former Army drill sergeant. And I'm the one who came out after the last day and said, 
you have won over this audience to the point that if you had yelled, Ollie, down for 20, we would have all been on the floor and you would have spent the rest of the day picking this up. So with that, <laughs> I bid you a good night. <laughs> Well, yeah, thanks for those the, those comments, John. You, you packed in a, a, a lot there. I mean, one of the things that, I, j just very briefly, one of the things that I'd say is I agree 100% that, that there's a, a tendency to use schools as sort of like a cure-all policy solution to a yes. lot of things and putting way, and, and I mean, it's, a lot of this lands on teachers. Um, and and and, it, and you're wrong. I mean, you're right. It is, is, it is wrong to sort of like, view the schools as this can be our policy instrument to change whatever uh, ill effects us in, in society. And, and that comment is, is um, you know, well received, at, at least on my part. The other thing though that I'd say is that, you know, I think schools form, I mean, they're an agent of political socialization. I mean, you know, I'm a huge believer in public schools. I'm a, I'm a product of public schools. And one of the things that I, I think well-run public schools can do is it's not necessarily in the classroom. You, you learn to rub along with people who are very different from you. I mean, they look different, they have different ideas. Um, and I know, you know, all high schools have cliques and every uh, things like that. But, um, you know, I, I, th I think that can be an important socialization function above and beyond sort of like any formal set of uh, you know, uh, education requirements. Before I, I thank our, our speaker, I want to remind everyone, first of all, I want to thank you all for, for joining us uh, this, this season for this winter lecture series. But what I mentioned earlier is that you have an opportunity, we really invite you uh, to offer your comments about the, uh, the winter lecture series this year and your suggestions for topics to be considered for the future. Uh, Bob put in the chat uh, an email, uh, his email, that you can send these to. This is free form. There's not an evaluation form as such. Uh, and I'll read it for those of you who, who may not have seen it. It's the word music at unitarianlincoln.org. Music at unitarianlincoln. Dot org. Bob is the music director there. But in the in the heading of your email, just put the word winter lecture series or WLS. So he'll be able to, to look at that and then winnow through them and, and let the committee, the planning committee, know what your thoughts are on both this year's lecture and, uh, and topics for the future. Um, Kevin, thank you very much for, for this engaging talk. And, and, and a nice series of questions and responses that, that lasted a, a good half hour plus. So that, that tells me that, that people were, were really uh, listening to you and, uh, and, and wanted to think about this more. And I hope that people don't stop thinking about it now that the series is over for 2023. This is an ongoing serious issue, polarization in the United States. And while we focus primarily on the global aspect, we focus today on the uh, the domestic aspect, but uh, nobody wants polarization, and I think it's our it's our job and it's our civic duty to do what we can to uh, to decrease the polarization. As Kevin says, to be charitable and try to put ourselves in the shoes of people who with whom we disagree, and see if we can come to some some peaceful discussion. We may not convince each other but at least we should listen to each other. And with that, Kevin, thank you. And thank you all for participating this year. And we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you all. Yeah, thank okay. you everybody. Thanks, yeah. For, thanks for inviting me, I really appreciate it. Okay.